Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Jim Gadsden. I'm a diplomat in residence at the Woodrow Wilson School for Public and International Affairs. We're honored to welcome Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, William Burns, who will speak with us today on the topic, Foreign Policy Challenges Facing the New Administration. Under Secretary Burns holds the rank of career ambassador, which is the highest rank in our foreign service. In May of 2008, he was appointed Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, which is the highest career position in the State Department. Earlier in his distinguished career, he served as ambassador to Russia, Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, Ambassador to Jordan, Special Assistant to the President, and Senior Director for Near East and South Asian Affairs on the National Security Council staff. He has also been Executive Secretary of the State Department and Special Assistant to Secretaries of State Madeleine Albright and Warren Christopher. In addition to two Presidential Distinguished Service Awards, Under Secretary Burns received throughout his career numerous honors for his exemplary service to the United States. Ambassador Burns earned a BA in History from LaSalle University and an MPhil and a DPhil from Oxford University. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Under Secretary Burns. Thank you very much, Jim, for that kind introduction, and I really am delighted to be here this afternoon. It truly is an honor uh, to be at Princeton uh, University, for which I have enormous admiration. And it's an honor also to be introduced by Ambassador Jim Gadsden and to be here with a number of friends from the State Department, Dan Kurtzer and Barbara Bodine and Bob Finn, Tom Christensen, who also served in the department. Um, all of them are public servants of uncommon integrity and skill, and all of them are greatly missed at the Department of State. Uh, all of them, on the other hand, look almost shamefully relaxed and happy here, <laughs> and clearly are having little difficulty keeping their nostalgia for Washington under control. Princeton is very lucky to have all of you um, and I, I must add that the State Department is very lucky to have uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter, formerly Dean of the Wilson School, and now our Director of Policy Planning. Uh, Anne-Marie is a terrific colleague, uh, already doing an excellent job at an extraordinary moment for America and for the world. I'd like to talk a little bit this afternoon about that moment uh, and about the opportunities it holds for the United States uh, if we use our assets wisely. I know diplomats have a very well-deserved reputation for being long-winded, so I'll do my best to break that stereotype this afternoon and be undiplomatically brief. Whenever I think of the value of brevity in public speaking, I'm reminded of a story involving the famous author George Bernard Shaw. Um, it seems that Shaw was hosting a public event in London one day, and the first speaker came up to him and asked him how long he should speak for. And Shaw told him he probably should limit his remarks to about 20 minutes. The speaker looked at him in horror and said, 20 minutes? How am I supposed to tell them everything I know in 20 minutes? And Shaw paused and replied, in your case, my advice would be to speak very slowly. <laughs> in, my, in my case, you don't have to worry about me going much beyond 20 minutes, even if I speak very slowly. Uh, I entered the uh, Foreign Service in 1982 in a world defined largely by the Cold War and with an international order organized largely around Soviet-American rivalry. 27 years later, the world is, of course, a much different place and a constant source of humility for those of us trying to navigate through it in pursuit of our country's interests and values. It is a profoundly interdependent world in which the interconnectedness of human society at the beginning of a new century holds both new promise and new peril. In recent years, interdependence has spurred economic growth, lifting more people out of poverty faster than at any time in human history. 
But as we see with each passing day, financial and economic crises can sweep across the globe even more quickly. It is an often schizophrenic world in which some non-state actors fight poverty, improve health, and expand education in the poorest parts of the world, while other non-state actors traffic in drugs, children, and women, and kill innocent civilians in every corner of the earth, from Manhattan to Beslan to Bali. The world you and I face today has no shortage of new troubles. It is a world dominated by the spreading dangers of weapons of mass destruction, new and more malignant forms of violent extremism, unresolved regional and sectarian conflicts, failed and failing states, global economic dislocation, and transnational health, energy, and environmental concerns. It is a world in which American vision and leadership are essential in crafting relations with emergent and re-emergent great powers and deepening their stake in global institutions and a stable international system. It is a world in which other people and other societies will always have their own realities, not always hospitable to ours. That doesn't mean that we have to accept those perspectives or agree with them or indulge them, but it does mean that understanding them is the starting point for sensible policy. It is a world in which a little modesty in the pursuit of American interests is often a good thing, in which there's still no substitute for setting careful priorities and connecting means to ends. It is a world in which the power of our example and our generosity of spirit matter more than our preaching. It is a world in which our leadership should serve as a catalyst for making common cause with others. It is a world in which America has no permanent enemies and in which tough-minded engagement of our adversaries is a mark of strength and confidence, not weakness. And it is a world, as both Secretary Clinton and Secretary of Defense Gates have said, in which the many instruments of American soft power must be expanded alongside the tools of hard power. It is also a world in which the election of Barack Obama has reminded us and the rest of the international community of what we're capable, of our capacity for renewal, of our capacity to repair historical wrongs and injustices, of our capacity to do great things, even at times of great challenges. It is easy in this turbulent and uncertain world to see nothing but troubles and to lose sight of the opportunities for American leadership. Let me quickly highlight three of them. The first is the opportunity to include rising great powers more fully in a modern global order. As Fareed Zakaria has pointed out, the bipolar system of the Cold War and the unipolar moment of unchallenged American supremacy in the immediate post-Cold War period have given way to an era in which America's role in the world is still central, but other powers are catching up. Within 15 years, the combined GDP of the so-called BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, could equal that of the original G7. Within that time frame, China is likely to become the world's biggest consumer of natural resources and its biggest polluter as well. And within that time frame, with China, India, and Japan likely to rank as the global economy's second, third, and fourth largest economies, a massive transfer of global wealth from west to east is likely to continue. A central challenge and a central opportunity for American leadership in the coming years is to use our still considerable leverage in the international system to shape and encourage responsible roles for emerging and re-emerging powers, in particular the BRIC countries. No country's evolution over the next decade will be more significant for us and for global order than China's. Bob Zelik, now president of the World Bank, coined the term responsible stakeholder several years ago, and while not all Chinese leaders were wild about the phrase, it aptly described the opportunity before both China itself and the international community. India, soon to be the world's most populous country and already by far its largest democracy, is another power on the economic and geopolitical rise. With interests and influence that go far beyond South Asia, India has an increasingly significant global role unfolding before it. And with bipartisan roots stretching back to the 1990s, the transformation and growth of the U.S.-India relationship have been striking. 
In recent years, India has been America's fastest growing export market, and the recently concluded civil nuclear initiative has further strengthened relations. Much more is possible, and India will be a very high priority for the Obama administration. It is hard to imagine tangible progress on climate change or global trade talks or in a number of other critical areas without India's active involvement. Much the same is true with Brazil, a remarkably diverse country roughly the size of the United States sprawling across South America. As President Obama and President Lula discussed in Washington last week, Brazil is emerging as not only a powerful hemispheric partner, but also as an increasingly important global player. A leader in biofuels and renewable energy, Brazil is another crucial priority for the United States. Nor do we have the luxury of ignoring Russia, a country written off by many in the 1990s, but uninhibited about asserting itself today. As I saw during my tenure as ambassador in Moscow from 2005 until 2008, our mutual frustration has tended in recent years to obscure our mutual interests. But the unmistakable reality is that we need each other in many ways. And how well or how poorly we manage our relations matters greatly to the rest of the world. Controlling 95% of the world's nuclear arsenal, the United States and Russia have unique capabilities and unique responsibilities for nuclear leadership. President Obama and Secretary Clinton have made clear our commitment to complete a successor agreement to start by the end of this year, and there is much more that Russia and America can do to strengthen the global nonproliferation regime in the run-up to the NPT Review Conference in 2010. Meanwhile, the United States will support Russia's prompt accession to the World Trade Organization, which is increasingly in Russia's interests as well as our own. For the BRIC countries and for a number of emerging regional players ranging from Turkey to Indonesia, a strategy of inclusion makes very good sense for America. It has substantial consequences for both our bilateral relationships and international architecture, reform of the United Nations Security Council, the future of the Bretton Woods institutions, and the role of the G groupings that now run from G8 to G20. It is better for us to start shaping that future now while our influence is strong than wait for events and trends to shape it for us. As a more inclusive world order develops, the United States will have, it seems to me, a second valuable opportunity before it. The opportunity to mobilize coalitions of countries and international institutions and non-state actors to tackle the world's most pressing problems. We cannot solve those problems on our own. And it is certainly true that getting our own house in order is an essential ingredient for successful leadership. But it is also true that most of those problems cannot be solved without an active American role. I do not mean that as an expression of American hubris, of which we are rarely in short supply. I have always believed that a dose of humility is a healthy thing in the conduct of American foreign policy. It's worth remembering a comment of Winston Churchill, an affectionate but very insightful observer of America. Churchill once said that the thing I admire most about Americans is that they always do the right thing in the end. It's just that they always like to exhaust all the alternatives first. We do make mistakes, shocking as that may seem, and we gain in global status when we admit them and then show how our own democratic system can reliably correct them. And in that sense, President Obama's decisions to close Guantanamo and make clear that America will not torture give us far more space for encouraging respect for human rights, the rule of law, and the possibilities of democracy than any amount of American lecturing. There are countless examples around the world of instances in which the American ability to mobilize proves valuable to our own interests and improves the human condition more generally. President Bush's ambitious drive against HIV AIDS is one good example. And from organizing others to combat piracy off the coast of East Africa to pulling together a coalition of countries and organizations to provide emergency tsunami relief, the American role is often vital and irreplaceable. Nowhere is the American ability to mobilize more important today 
than in the seething swath of the globe that extends from the Middle East through Southwest Asia. Plagued by unresolved regional conflicts, especially the Palestinian issue, high population growth, too few jobs, undiversified economies, unresponsive political systems, the dangers of WMD proliferation, and violent extremist groups feeding off all of the above, the ills of the wider Middle East cry out for American leadership in pursuit of a positive agenda for the region, an agenda which views problems such as the Arab-Israeli conflict with a lack of basic freedoms or economic hopelessness not as an a la carte menu, but as challenges which ought to be addressed simultaneously and systematically across a broad front with maximum participation of key players inside and outside the region, and an agenda which offers hope and a sense of possibility for people who for far too long have had far too little of either. That is the ultimate antidote to the fundamentally destructive agenda of Al-Qaeda and other extremists who are much better at tearing down than building up. That positive agenda is exactly what draws together the early and energetic diplomacy of Secretary Clinton and George Mitchell and Richard Holbrooke. It's what animates our interest in a big tent conference next week in Europe to strengthen regional and international support for stability in Afghanistan and Pakistan. It's what animates our continuing support for Iraq, for its reintegration into the Arab world, and for stability in its relations with neighbors like Turkey and Iran. And it's what animates our concern amidst a global recession for economic modernization in a region desperately in need of it. To cite one small example, I'll never forget the impact that our willingness to think creatively about economic possibilities had on our relations with Jordan in the aftermath of King Hussein's death in 1999. I was ambassador in Amman during that period, and King Abdullah, who succeeded his legendary father at the age of 37, used to remind me that 80% of his population was younger than he was. That created unrelenting pressures for new job creation each year. As one response, we negotiated a bilateral free trade agreement with Jordan, which helped increase Jordan's exports to the United States from a total of $9 million in 1998 to more than $1 billion in 2002 and launched tens of thousands of new jobs for Jordanians. A third opportunity before us in this new era is the opportunity to renew diplomacy and development as tools of American policy abroad alongside defense, to renew our commitment to soft power alongside our unquestioned capacity for hard power. Secretary Clinton likes to use the term smart power to describe a strategy which harnesses the full range of instruments of American national power, diplomatic, economic, military, political, legal, and cultural. Such a strategy must be forward thinking. It requires us to look for opportunities rather than just respond to crises. It requires more effective application of information technology to reach people beyond their governments. It means partnering with the private sector, international organizations, and civil society to provide reach, leverage, and scale. Smart power means cooperation and unity of effort within the U.S. government which can sometimes seem like an unnatural act to career bureaucrats like me, but which has never been more important. It means cooperation with our allies across the regions of the world. And it means listening, hearing, asking, and consulting, all essential ingredients for effective American leadership. In practical terms, the United States needs to invest more aggressively in the tools of diplomacy and development. Secretary of Defense Gates is an especially eloquent advocate of substantial increases in funding for the State Department and the Agency for International Development. He often notes that the size of the entire American diplomatic corps today, some 6,500 foreign service officers, is smaller than the number of personnel in U.S. military bands. I have nothing against military musicians, but there does seem to be something of an imbalance in our priorities. We also need to reinvigorate America's foreign assistance mechanisms. AID, as Secretary Clinton pointed out during her confirmation hearing, has been decimated in the post-Cold War era. It now has roughly half 
the core of development professionals that it once had and has gradually become more of a contracting agency than an operational body. Much the same is true of our educational and cultural exchange programs. Once the pride of the old U.S. Information Agency had long a powerful instrument for connecting with other societies and other peoples. The smartest investment we made in Russia in the 1990s, dollar for dollar, was in a variety of exchange programs, from the Flex program for Russian high school students, launched by one of Princeton's most accomplished alumni, Senator Bill Bradley, to the Fulbright program for graduate and postgraduate students. Today, there are some 70,000 alumni of these and similar programs across the 11 time zones of Russia, and they remain a durable bridge between our two societies, however complicated the politics between our two governments. I know that I've now drifted perilously close to the 20-minute barrier that I promised to respect at the outset of these remarks. And I know, too, that I've just scratched the surface of the challenges of this moment in Americans exper America's experience with the rest of the world. But I hope I've conveyed some sense of the significant opportunities before us, the opportunity to include rising powers, the opportunity to mobilize others against the world's most pressing problems, the opportunity to renew our instruments of diplomacy and development alongside our indisputable military strength. There's a final opportunity that I hope many of you in this room will consider amidst all the other possibilities that a Princeton education opens up for you, and that is the opportunity to serve, uh, the opportunity for public service and especially for a career in diplomacy. To be honest, I truly did not expect when I entered the Foreign Service in the early 1980s that I would still be doing this more than a quarter century later, and I certainly never dreamed that I'd have the opportunities uh, to make a difference that I've had. My attitude when I joined was much like that of one of my most distinguished predecessors in Moscow and another product of Princeton, George Kennan, who said in his elegant memoirs that his decision to try to enter the Foreign Service was based mostly on a feeling that I did not know what else to do and that the Foreign Service would be his best protection from falling into, as he put it, some sort of occupational rut. While it hasn't always been easy or fun, the Foreign Service has certainly kept me out of occupational ruts, and it has enabled me to work with some of America's finest public servants, like Jim Gadsden and Dan Kurtzer and my other colleagues here today. I wouldn't trade that experience for anything, and I hope that you'll consider what the Foreign Service might hold for you and what you might contribute to it. After 27 years as an American diplomat, spent mostly in two parts of the world, the Middle East and Russia, which are notorious breeders of pessimists, I remain, strangely enough, an optimist about America's role in the world and the opportunities before us. Now, whenever I say that, one of my Russian friends invariably reminds me of one of the many typically fatalistic Russian definitions of an optimist, as someone who believes that tomorrow will be better than the day after. Um, I mean something a little different. I actually think that tomorrow and the next few years are likely to be very complicated for the United States as we seek to climb out of a deep economic recession and some very deep problems overseas. But I have enduring faith in our resilience and our creativity and our capacity for seizing opportunities amidst troubles. And I hope that all of you will find a way to be a part of that great endeavor. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary has agreed to take questions. Uh, may I suggest that those who wish to raise questions use the mics on either side of the room? Great. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank Hi. you for your, your talk today. Um, I can see why you're a diplomat. That was a rather uh, scathing indictment of a prior administration done very eloquently. Um, can you talk about the economic crisis that I think many of our allies think emanated here and how that impacts our ability to uh, direct 
our allies uh, in foreign policy? Sure. Well, it, it obviously, the global financial crisis has a huge impact in any direction that you look. I mean, it's obviously um, the issue that more than any other dominates the intention, uh, the attention of our leadership as well as leaderships around the world. Um, I think it, its impact can be felt in areas ranging from the budgetary strictures that it imposes here. You know, during the presidential election campaign, you saw then Senator Obama calling for a doubling of American foreign assistance. And this obviously, the, the global financial crisis and the budgetary pressures that evolve from that obviously make it a lot more complicated to take those kind of steps, at least in the short term. In other parts of the world, uh, the global economic crisis can lead to new kinds of pressures, whether it's in terms of food prices and food security and the social and political consequences that flow from that. Uh, it can easily lead, if without careful leadership, toward a wave of protectionism, a movie that you know, the international community saw before, 70 years ago, and that I think can do lasting damage. And so I think that's what puts a premium on good leadership, not only at the G20 summit meeting that's supposed to take place and that will take place in a week in London, um, but in the uh, continuing efforts to coordinate, not just between the United States and, and its, you know, European and other allies in the G20, but also in terms of uh, keeping a careful eye on the impact on the poorest countries in the world, um, where I think, um, you know, the dangers in some ways are even greatest to the global financial crisis. So this is, it's, you know, it's, it's a crisis whose consequences are going to be felt for a long time to come, not just for our country, but around the world. Sure. Well, well I mean, there were, there were a number of countries that I think at first thought that they were going to be immune from the, the, the crisis that it, as it first emerged in the U.S. market. Uh, I think, you know, most economies around the, uh, around the world have since discovered that no one is really immune from this in one way or the other. So I think whatever, you know, inclination there was early on to blame the United States has been quickly overtaken by the magnitude of the problem and the importance of, of trying to work together. Um, but that's not to suggest that there are lots of people who don't think that you know, the U.S. bears a large share of the responsibility. But as I said, I think the focus has shifted now much more to how do we work together to get out of this crisis. Sir. Uh, thank you again for your remarks. I appreciated them. I just heard today that China fired, fired a bow shot right across our deck with respect to the forthcoming G20 meeting. Namely, uh, they suggested the dollar be uh, replaced by an IMF sort of monetary system to support the world currencies. Given the strategy that our State Department uh, has, I wonder if you would comment on what our approach ought to be. Well, you're a step ahead of me first, since um, I've been blissfully unaware of news like that over the course of today. Um, so I really don't have any particularly com particular comment to offer on that. Um, and I'll also quickly reveal the limits of my wisdom in international economic issues um, if, I, if I went much further than that. But I honestly did not see that piece of news today. Sorry not to be more helpful on that one, but yes, ma'am. Would you say diplomacy conducted through summits is as effective as that conducted through the, like, detente? Well, you mean in directly between two countries and sort of... Well, detente, I think of a more, say, the Nixon era when there was a balance between China and Russia. Say a balance of powers. Well, I think, I mean, I think the, the world has shifted in lots of ways, you know, in the last 30 years, 35 years since the Nixon era. Uh, I mean, I think there, there are certain realities about relations amongst countries that haven't changed. I mean, amongst the, the importance of investing in great power relations, as I uh, tried to suggest in my opening remarks. But at the same time, as I also suggested, I mean, we live in a world which you know, is, is much more interconnected than it's ever been before. And so that puts a premium on whether it's this G20 summit that's coming up in a week or other forms of coordination, because I think it's increasingly the case that it's difficult to make progress 
in dealing with, whether it's a global financial issues or uh, health challenges like HIV AIDS or, or environmental challenges like climate change, unless we're working more effectively multilaterally. Now, of course, that was true 30 or 40 years ago. I just think it's even more true today. So, you know, in looking at American diplomacy, I think we have to be prepared to invest heavily in, in those key bilateral relationships, but also in the kind of multilateral diplomacy that we do at summits, that we do through institutions like the United Nations. Um, we've got to be able to juggle all of those things, I think, at the same time. Thanks. Yes, sir. Ambassador, thank you so much for coming to the Woodrow Wilson School. Sure. My question is about expectations and, and how diplomats abroad and foreign service officers have to either manage or, or work with expectations that other countries might have given President Obama's rise to power. And, uh, his power certainly evoked many emotions, even, even in the Islamic Republic of Iran. And so what is the challenge of a foreign service officer to deal with these types of issues? Well, it's probably not an argument for us deflating expectations by making a lot of mistakes. I mean, that's one way of doing it. But um, no, I, I think you're right. I think President Obama's election has uh, created expectations which are very, very difficult for any government or any leader to fulfill. Um, I think the changes in tone and approach that you've already seen in barely two months in office are very important ones. But I think that still leaves us with some extremely difficult challenges before us. Uh, it's inevitable, I suppose, that you know, expectations will, will rise very high early on. But um, you know, I think what you'll continue to see from the President and Secretary Clinton is a real determination to follow through on those changes in tone and approach and try to create some tangible achievements. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, as a student spending this summer in Turkey, I was wondering if you could expand on the United States priorities and challenges with um, Turkey. Sure. Well, it's a hugely important relationship. I mean, a country of uh, 70 million people, uh, a, a secular Muslim uh, society. Um, in any direction on the compass that you look, whether it's south toward the Arab world and the Middle East, whether it's uh, you know, east in the direction of Southwest Asia, north toward the Caucasus and Russia, or west, if I'm getting my directions right, in the direction of Europe, I mean, Turkey plays a really pivotal role. And so it's no coincidence that Secretary Clinton, on one of her first trips overseas, uh, stopped in Turkey about a week ago. It's no coincidence that President Obama um, intends to visit Turkey uh, at the end of his upcoming European trip. Um, it's a relationship in which I think it's very important for us to invest because whether it's Turkey's recent role in trying to encourage indirect talks between Syria and Israel in terms of the Middle East peace process, whether it's the role that Turkey can play in helping to stabilize Iraq, the role that Turkey can continue to play in Afghanistan, um, I think it's one of those relationships which is going to be increasingly important from the point of view of American interest and stability in a number of different parts of the world that matter greatly to us. So I think you're going to see um, the U.S.-Turkish relationship um, continue to be a very high priority for this administration. Sure. Yes, sir. Mr. Secretary, the, the 2008 National Defense Authorization Act requires the Secretary of Defense uh, together with the Secretary, in collaboration with the Secretaries of Energy and State to form a nuclear posture of your nuclear nuclear weapons policy. That's supposed to be reported back to the Congress this calendar year. I wonder if you could speak to us about the interaction that you see between the U.S. Nuclear Posture Review and our foreign policy. Well, I think it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a, an extremely important exercise, as it's been in the past. And I think as we look ahead to some of the challenges I mentioned in my opening remarks, particularly the NPT review in 2010, the challenges of arms control between the United States and Russia, it's obviously very important to connect that to the nuclear posture review and what we're doing in terms of our own force structure. Um, so. Um, I, I think what you're going to see is the United States moving ahead energetically in terms of the arms control agenda with Russia. You've already heard that. But at the same time, um, you know, we'll, we'll move ahead just as we've already committed to trying to complete the nuclear posture review this year. Do you anticipate that state will be well integrated into that review? I, I do. And I think it's going to be essential to do that because it's very difficult, I think, to look at the challenges of arms control and nonproliferation 
um, without that kind of very close coordination between state and defense, as well as the Department of Energy. So, yes, I, I do think there'll be close integration on that. Sure. Yes, sir. I wonder if you comment on the strategic value of the expansion of NATO missile defense versus the irritation of Russia. Sure. Well, first, with regard to the issue of NATO enlargement, and particularly the, the, the you know, the questions that have been most recently on the table and remain on the table about Ukraine's membership and potential membership for Georgia. Um, the position of the United States, like the position of NATO as a whole, going back to the, the last NATO summit last May in Bucharest, is to be supportive uh, of eventual membership for Ukraine and Georgia. Having said that, um, a, a number of factors come into play. I mean, first is the fact that um, the ultimate decisions about membership uh, have to be made by the alliance as a whole. Second, there are certain fairly rigorous criteria that have to be met. And third, there has to clearly be an expression of support from the people of both of those countries or any other country that wants to become a member of NATO. So while the United States will continue to support expanded membership in NATO, I think it's fair to say that neither Ukraine nor Georgia are ready today for membership in NATO. And the process is likely to be, you know, a very complicated one to get from, from here to there. Um, the Russian government has made no secret of its uh, opposition to further expansion of NATO, particularly involving Ukraine. Um, but as I said, this is a process that's likely to, to uh, take some years, um, I think, before you see it move ahead to any, any uh, decision points with regard to actual membership. Missile defense is another issue that's been uh, neuralgic uh, between us and Russia. Uh, we've made very clear over the course of the last couple of years that the missile defense plans, the missile defense agreements that we've entered into with Poland and the Czech Republic are directed against an Iranian threat, that they're not meant and they do not threaten in any way Russia's security. But I don't mean to understate uh, the degree of Russian concern about those plans. Um, we've made equally clear over the last couple of months that should the, the threat, which has motivated those plans in the first place, uh, be eliminated, then obviously, um, that's to say the Iranian threat, um, then that's obviously going to shape the way in which we approach those missile defense plans. We've also made clear uh, in the Obama administration that we're quite open to the possibility of broader cooperative arrangements on missile defense that could involve the United States or other NATO partners and Russia. So I think there are some opportunities before us, but we're going to continue to work very carefully with the Polish government and the Czech government, um, uh, but we'll be open to the possibilities that I mentioned before. Sir. Thank you for um, There was recently a symbolic episode of uh, whether you reset the button in their relations, uh, whether it's in part uh, an acknowledgement of some mistakes made perhaps on both sides, and why would relations be different from this point? Well, I think, it, you know, as I mentioned before, and I lived through this in three years as uh, the U.S. ambassador in Moscow, I, I, I think that it's no secret that there's been a lot of frustration between the United States and Russia in recent years. I think, as I said, that that frustration has tended to obscure the fact that in a number of very important areas, there, there is clear common ground between the United States and Russia. And even more importantly than that common ground between us is the fact that uh, our leadership on issues like um, nuclear nonproliferation matters enormously to the rest of the world. That our leadership on issues like the Iranian nuclear problem matters enormously because it's very difficult to envisage a diplomatic solution to the Iranian nuclear challenge that doesn't involve cooperation between the United States and Russia. So I think the opportunity before us, the opportunity to reset relations, um, lies in the fact that you have a new leadership in Washington, you have a relatively new leadership in President Medvedev in Russia. Um, and an opportunity that the two presidents are going to discuss in about a week in London when they meet on the 1st of April to see if we can't build on those areas a common ground. Now, that's not to suggest that we aren't going to continue to have differences because we do have them today, and I'm sure we will continue to have them. But I think that, that there still is an opportunity to do a lot more than we've been able to do in recent years. Nuclear leadership is just one example. There may be more that we can do together on Afghanistan. 
an issue um, that matters to Russia as well, because Russia doesn't have an interest in instability in Afghanistan. Russia doesn't have an interest in the flow of narcotics outside Afghanistan's borders, which can have a, a, a serious negative impact on Russian society itself. Uh, we work reasonably well together in the Middle East, the Middle East peace process, Arab-Israeli issues. Um, even on issues like energy, which have been a source of friction sometimes in the past between the United States and Russia, the reality remains that Russia today is the world's biggest producer of hydrocarbons, of oil and gas. The United States is the biggest consumer. So there ought to be a way in which we have a dialogue about those kind of issues. So I think there is an opportunity here, and I do think that there are leaders, there's a a commitment both in Washington and on the part of the Russian leadership to try and explore those opportunities, and we'll see what we can make of it. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for coming. Um, during the Bush administration, there was a lot of conflict between the um, government in Washington and mostly European governments as well as other governments outside about the role of international law and how binding it is. What do you see as the role of international law as, during the um, Obama administration, and how do you think that will impact diplomacy? Well, I think what you've already uh, heard from President Obama and from Secretary Clinton is uh, a fair amount of respect for international law um, and uh, commitment in a number of different areas um, to uh, try and invest in that. Um, as well, whether it's through the United Nations or in other kinds of international bodies. Um, you've seen that in terms of the approach of the administration to climate change, which has a number of international legal consequences as well. So that doesn't necessarily make each of the particular issues easy to deal with. But I think you're going to see, I mean, you will see an administration which not only will exhibit a respect for international law, but sees its utility not just from the point of view of American interests and values, but a stable glo global order. Thanks. Sir. Um, two questions. So first of all about Iran. Um, what does diplomacy with Iran mean, um, especially in terms of, um, in light of the forthcoming elections that are supposed to take place uh, at, the, at the presidential level? And second question I had was about um, what you thought about the abolitionist movement that Kissinger and um, et al. are advocating in light of nuclear capabilities of the U.S. And the world. Mm -hmm. Well, first, um, on the, the question of going to zero in terms of nuclear weapons, which sec former Secretary Kissinger, Secretary Schultz, and a Sam Nunn, and a number of other very prominent Americans have argued for. Um, <clears throat> it seems to me that you know, as a, as a goal, I can understand the value um, of, of, you know, a world in which ultimately you don't have nuclear weapons. The reality is that there's a lot of distance to be covered between here and there. Um, and so what it puts a premium on is um, beginning to revive movement and momentum towards the kind of arms control understandings between the United States and Russia, given, again, the reality that the United States and Russia control 95% of the world's nuclear weapons that I think are very important. Um, you do see, I think, a commitment on the part of both the United States and Russia uh, to reach a, a legally binding uh, successor agreement to start by the end of 2009. Not an easy task, but I think a very important one and to build toward uh, significant further reductions in our strategic nuclear arsenals. I think that puts us both, the United States and Russia, in a stronger position to argue for tightening non the nonproliferation regime in the world um, because by setting a good example in the management and reduction of our own nuclear arsenals, I think it puts us in a place where we can convey a more powerful message to the rest of the world, which has a direct bearing on the Iranian issue, um, your question about diplomacy. Um, what President Obama has made clear, including during the presidential election campaign, is that we'll engage directly with Iran on a whole range of issues, not only the nuclear one. I think we will continue to invest in the multilateral process which exists which brings us together with the other permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany, with whom we've been working in recent years, um, uh, to, to try as best we can through diplomacy um, to reach a resolution of that issue, a resolution which ensures that Iran does not have a nuclear weapons capability. The issue with regard to Iran has never been whether or not Iran has a right to civilian nuclear power. Of course it has that right. The question is how it applies it. 
and whether or not it meets its international obligations answers the legitimate questions that the International Atomic Energy Agency has been asking for some years now about past weaponization activities on the part of Iran. So the question is whether or not uh, is Iran is ready to meet those international obligations. If it is, uh, through a serious diplomatic effort on which the United States will be engaged, then I think a lot is possible. And we and our partners in the so-called P5 plus one process have made clear what's possible for Iran and, and the Iranian people um, if it addresses those international obligations. Rob, question. So sure. could you foresee in the long term an agreement between the US and Iran that's going to be modeled after the India-US partnership? No, the, well, the U.S.-India civil nuclear initiative of last year, I think, reflected a number of realities that are in some ways unique to India today. I mean, India is a country that, you know, has demonstrated over a period of time um, a responsible approach um, to nuclear issues um, through its own behavior over a series of decades, two or three decades now. Um, and it's, it's a, a government in India which has made clear its commitment to joining the additional protocol of the NPT, to taking a number of other steps to reassure the international community um, about its intentions. And so I think that's what sets India apart and sets that particular nuclear initiative apart. Sir. Thank you very much. Hi. And thank you also the, for the hopeful tone with which you have answered many of the questions. Um, I come with I'll try. Of, um, uh, uh, unusual, unexpected question. Yes. As somebody who um, is concerned about uh, the appearance of the United States uh, through diplomacy abroad, and you mentioned in your eloquent presentation before um, soft power and smart power, um, diplomacy also means being present on a bilateral level. And the way how the American embassies have been shaped and reconstructed, uh, especially post the global makes us and makes our embassies appear abroad as fortifications um, and everything but accessible. And this policy gets obviously translated also to diplomats, younger, medium range, and high range, uh, uh, high level diplomats whose mode of interaction and outreach is dramatically curtailed because of security consideration. My question to uh, you is now, what can we expect, and since hopefully there are several young and future mm -hmm. diplomats here in the room, what can they expect as being the new, I understand, of course, slowly implemented mm -hmm. policy? which may bring America back for the international community to that land of open uh, opportunities and outreach uh, as it was seen in the 60s and 70s. That's a very good question because I think as for me and I know from a number of my other colleagues um, who have served as Foreign Service Officer of the United States, one of the biggest frustrations in recent years have been the limitations and the constraints. I remember when I was ambassador in Jordan in the late 1990s, you know, we ended up with what sometimes seemed like a Ford Apache. You know, the whole purpose of being a diplomat overseas is to be able to engage not just with your counterparts in foreign governments, but just as importantly or even more importantly with whole societies. It's very difficult to do that um, if you have, you know, armored personnel carriers ranged around your embassy. That's not exactly the most inviting sign for people to come visit you. Um, I think what you'll see is not a sort of magic formula because the truth is in today's world, a number of those security precautions are gonna have to continue. But I do think what you're gonna see, particularly in this administration, is a renewed commitment to outreach, to make use as, as best as we possibly can of new information technologies. You know, President Obama is a big fan and user of YouTube. His recent, you know, Nauru's message to Iranians was broadcast on YouTube as well as, you know, through um, other mechanisms. So that's one thing. Second, I think, again, within the limits of our budgetary pressures, you're going to see a renewed focus on exchange programs, on the kind of things that I think 
Um, whereas I said before, one of some of the best investments dollar for dollar that we've ever made overseas. Uh, investment in trying to expand our diplomatic corps as best we can so we have more officers so they're better trained in terms of their language abilities, better able to interact with other societies. You also see more of an effort to ensure that our officers at embassy, embassies, and we did this when I was ambassador in Russia, again, as best we could, were spending most of their time outside of embassies. Um, where, where you, you can have consulates, and we had three, which is just a drop in the bucket across 11 time zones of Russia. Um, you need to invest in them, but you also need to invest in very active travel programs. So some of the officers who worked with me in Moscow literally spent um, well over half their time outside the embassies traveling around the country. There, there's no substitute for that, to put a real live American against a policy, because that's how people understand what we're about. And uh, so it's easy to say, it's harder to deliver on, but I think you, you will see a real determination over the next few years to try as best we can uh, to, to stretch the boundaries of some of those inevitable security precautions. Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah. A uh, very good set of questions and obviously very serious concerns underlying all of them. And I wish I had a deep prescription to offer for you. Um, it's one of the issues that matters most from the point of view of United States interests as we look out over the next few years. It's one of the most difficult issues to deal with. Again, as I said, there's no, there's no neat prescription. There are a number of things that we're trying to do in this administration. And, you know, appointing Richard Holbrook um, to devote his considerable energies full-time to this issue, I think, is a reflection of the importance of the President, Secretary Clinton, attached to this. Um, again, uh, part of the solution is going to um, lie in providing as much support as we can to the Pakistani civilian government, providing economic assistance, not just from the United States, but from international financial institutions from other countries, that help that leadership to make the kinds of economic decisions that are required through its IMF program, the program that it recently entered into, that offers some hope of um, creating economic possibilities in parts of the country, especially in the, in the tribal areas where there hasn't been much economic hope for many years and where the absence of hope provides very fertile uh, soil uh, for extremists. Um, part of the challenge obviously lies in, in providing as much support as we can to Pakistani security services, uh, support aimed at um, dealing seriously with those kind of issues. Um, part of the challenge involves looking at Pakistan and Afghanistan and the challenges that emerge from both of those countries in regional terms. And that's, you know, a large part of what uh, underlies uh, the international conference that Secretary Clinton is going to take part in on the 31st of March in The Hague. In other words, to try to get other regional players to play more of a supportive role in helping to bring greater stability in Pakistan and Afghanistan because it's very difficult to separate um, you know, events in Pakistan from events in Afghanistan right now. So it's a long way of saying that it's one of the most difficult challenges, I think, that this administration faces now or that the international community faces. But those are some of the things that we're going to try to work hard on. Sure. Yes, sir. Okay. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. Thanks. Thank you for your very, 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 very speech. Um, the 
The, uh, the president spoke uh, Sunday uh, on 60 Minutes that uh, we have to have an end game for Afghanistan. What end game is he looking at for Afghanistan? What strategy for the uh, Israeli Israeli uh, Palestinian conflict? Sure. Um, a lot of easy questions wrapped into one. Um, uh, let me start with Iraq, then Afghanistan, then the Israeli Palestinian conflict. On Iraq, you know, one of the first things that President Obama did was to commission a policy review, which was completed, and he then made a speech in uh, North Carolina in which he laid out the, the main outlines of the administration's approach over the next few years. It made clear that um, our approach in Iraq is going to be a comprehensive one. In other words, that it's not just based on military tools of American power, that in military terms what we're talking about is a fairly significant and fairly rapid drawdown of military forces in which the combat mission would be completed by August of 2010 and a withdrawal of all American military forces by the end of 2011, which is consistent with the agreement that had been reached at the end of the last administration with the Iraqi government. At the same time, we're going to obviously have to continue to invest heavily in support of the Iraqis and their efforts at political reconciliation within Iraq itself, and also invest heavily in regional diplomacy, because it's very hard to envisage uh, durable stability in Iraq unless its biggest neighbors buy into that process. And so I think one of the most important dynamics you've seen over the last year or so has been Iraq's gradual reintegration into the Arab world, the return of Arab embassies, Arab ambassadors to Baghdad, Iraq's gradual reemergence within the Arab world as an integrated player, and that's going to be very important. Afghanistan, as I mentioned in response to the earlier question, is obviously a very tall order. And there again, all I would emphasize is just what the president said on Sunday, and that's the importance of a comprehensive approach, which sees military tools as only one of a number uh, that we try to make use of. Um, connected to a realistic set of objectives in Afghanistan, which he also spoke to on Sunday. Finally, on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, the Arab-Israeli conflict more generally, um, that is an issue that you know I've learned throughout my career, and many of you understand at least as well as I do, that's central in the minds and emotions of people throughout the Middle East. And it's always a mistake, it seems to me, for the United States to um, not to appreciate its centrality in the region. Uh, this administration, like its predecessors, I think believes firmly that a two-state solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is the only durable solution. That is also obviously much easier said than done at a time when the Israeli government is still in the process of being informed, when you have a Palestinian leadership that is beset by internal tensions and divisions, um, a Palestinian people living under occupation who uh, see less and less hope I think, for, for that kind of a two-state solution. Um, a security situation, especially in the run-up to the recent Gaza crisis that causes a lot of Israeli citizens to doubt whether or not that's possible or whether or not there's a reliable Palestinian partner. Having said all that, there's no substitute for American leadership on this issue. There's no substitute for the United States trying at the same time to, to work with Egypt and other countries to consolidate the ceasefire in Gaza, to try to ensure that um, there's greater stability, but at the same time connecting that to a long-term political solution. Because unless people have a sense of hope that a two-state solution is possible, it just seems to me that the negative consequences multiply, not just on Arab-Israeli issues, but around the, around the region. Um, there may be some possibilities on other tracks of the Arab-Israeli peace process, the Syrian or Lebanese tracks, um, We've recently started to re-engage with Syria, and uh, certainly we're not only really open to the possibility of, uh, of you know, eventual resumption of activity on the Syrian-Israeli track, but I think we'll support progress on all tracks of the peace process. So, you know, as I said before, um, none of those challenges are going to be easy ones, but I think all of them are going to demand a lot of attention and, and uh, political capital on the part of the administration. Sure. Yes, sir. Thanks for your patience.
Hi, you mentioned in your opening remarks that um, Secretary Gates has been a vocal proponent of expanding USAID uh, and the Foreign Service. And one of his justifications, as I understand it, is the military is taking on roles that it's impossible to. Yes, I'm sorry. The, is that the military is taking on roles that it doesn't usually right. engage in, for example, rebuilding in post-conflict states. So I'm wondering if you could talk about balance between the State Department and the Department of Defense um, in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, what your role should be, where the Army should be, what it's doing now, and how you find that balance. Sure. Well, no, it's a very good question, and I think one thing that you're going to see in Iraq, you're already seeing, and you're going to see increasingly in Afghanistan, is an expansion of both the civilian presence and the efforts, not just on the part of the Department of State, but a number of other executive branch agencies, the Department of Agriculture and others, where in Afghanistan, you know, it's very important to um, work with Afghans to create alternatives to poppy growing, for example. Um, so I think you're going to see, while at the same time you've already seen an increase of 17,000 American troops in Afghanistan, you're also going to see um, a greater emphasis on what civilian agencies, including the Department of State, can do there in support of the kind of comprehensive approach that I was describing before. You've already seen that in, in Iraq. I mean, Barbara served in you know, Iraq a few years ago. And so, you know, I think we've, we've learned over time um, the critical role that uh, American diplomacy has to play in Iraq. And I think over the course of the last couple of years, we've made a fair amount of progress um, in doing what diplomats do best in Iraq, especially under the leadership of our friend Ryan Crocker, who has been the ambassador recently uh, there, um, in trying to do everything we can as a key outside player to encourage reconciliation amongst uh, the most important Iraqi groups. So I think in, in both of those places, um, the, the role that diplomats can play, the role that other civilian personnel, non-military personnel can play is going to be crucial. It does require more resources. You know, Secretary Gates is right about that. Um, but that's going to that's going to require a long-term investment and a, I think a reordering of priorities that's long overdue. Thanks. Yes, sir. Thanks for your patience too. Yeah. In the Palestine. Yes. What do you think in this context is the meaning of the Israel ambassador? That I'm sorry. The real leadership of the United States is the, the point needed. What do you think that uh, the destiny or what happened to Ambassador Freeman revealed in this process? Oh, I don't, <clears throat> I don't know that. I mean, I, I don't, that doesn't, I think, have any impact on <clears throat> the president's commitment um, to, to play an active American leadership role on Arab-Israeli issues. Um, so I think that's a... That's a commitment that is going to be sustained over time. That doesn't mean that the progress is going to be quick or easy. Uh, but I think without that sense of commitment, it's very difficult to see how you make progress on a whole range of issues in the Middle East. I mean, and that's one of the lessons that we've learned hardest over the course of recent decades. So I, I think that commitment and determination is going to continue. Sure. Yes, sir. Mr. Undersecretary, my question is about um, on the issue of Russia placing long-range strategic bombers in Venezuela. Yes. How assertively is the administration being with Russia? From the Russia standpoint of the Russians on this, is this just a sophisticated sort of gamesmanship in real polit politique to try and gain chips that can be traded away by way of leverage over us? Is it done? Is it motivated by a desire to make a strategic point about spheres of influence thinking with respect to Georgia, Ukraine? Uh, is it that, or are we, heaven forbid, going to relive the Cuban Missile Crisis? No, I don't, I don't think we're going to relive the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, uh, I don't, it, it's very hard to explain what the motivations might be behind some of those actions, but I also think the truth is um, that it's not amongst the most significant concerns that, you know, the American national security establishment has right now. That's not to say that we don't pay attention to a lot of issues, because obviously what happens in this hemisphere matters a great deal to us. But what, what we've focused on, um, particularly over the course of the last two months in this administration in this hemisphere, has not been so much the kind of activities that you mentioned, but it's been more a case of how do we develop a more positive agenda for this hemisphere um, so that 
you know, it's not so much a function of the rhetoric from Chavez or others in the hemisphere. It's much more, I think, a function of how can we make common cause with leaderships and peoples in this hemisphere to deal with the challenges that matter most to them. So whatever Chavez or Morales or other leaders in the region may be saying, the reality is that, you know, if we want to have an effective strategy in this hemisphere, then we need to as I said, make common cause with others, whether it's in dealing with trade issues that can help open up new economic possibilities, whether it's in dealing with issues of social justice and poverty, which matter enormously uh, throughout the hemisphere, whether it's in dealing with a range of other issues from counter-narcotics through um, the, the sorts of um, deeply difficult dilemmas that the Mexican leadership faces now in dealing with narco-criminals. I mean, I think our challenge is less to be distracted by some of the kinds of things that you mentioned and more to try to focus on how we can help develop an agenda with partners in the hemisphere that connects with the problems that matter most to people in this hemisphere. And I think that's what's going to inform the approach of the administration to the Summit of the Americas, which takes place in Trinidad, Tobago in the middle of April, and the, the policies which emerge after that. So, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to be dismissive of the kind of concerns that, that you cited, but I think it seems to me that there are a lot bigger challenges and bigger issues that, that really require our, our energies and attention at this point. Thanks. I've stunned you into silence by now. Yeah, thanks. Well, anyways, I just... Oh, thanks.